Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson. You know, I have been studying uh, something lately that I think you're all going to be interested in, and that is passive income. We all want it. We all want to figure out the easiest and fastest path to getting to the said income. And so I've invited someone who has mastered this kind of area to share her experiences with us today. Welcome, Janet Stewart. Hello there. Hi, everyone. (laughs) We have Janet uh, mid-renovation in her offices, and so uh, she's in her beautiful new closet coming to us live to the Wealthy Speaker Show. And let me tell you, it's a gorgeous closet. She's living it. Um, Janet, it's, it's, I know that uh, e-learning is not going to be a hard case to make for people. Why do you think that people might want to include it in their offerings of, you know, speaking and, you know, training and all of those other things? Well, actually, Jane, I wouldn't say they might want to include it. I would say they need to include it unless they're planning to retire in the next few years, like really retire and not do business anymore. It's simply the expectation of the modern learner. If you think about anything in your home that you need to try to do, be it, uh, you know, your dishwasher starts to leak and you're trying to fiddle with it to, you know, it's the middle of a Saturday night and you can't get a plumber and you need to do something to stop that drip, you tend to turn to YouTube. Most people are like that. They go on the internet and they expect to be able to find the information they want now and educate themselves. And e-learning allows employees or customers uh, who are purchasing products and services to be able to access information and education about what it is, whatever it is that they need to know, but right now. Uh, And if you, if you're not moving some of your products and services into that online space, you're going to be missing out a big part of the economy. Okay, I love that uh, and agree. So tell me about, I have had, you've likely had many, and I've had many of my speaker clients come to me and say, okay, I uh, created my own course, but it's not selling. You know, I launched it, I did all the steps that I was told to do, and it didn't fly what do you see it from your adv- from your vantage point? What do you see might be happening there uh, when people build it and they don't come? Well, I'm not a marketing expert. I've never professed to be. I mm-hmm. do run a successful business, but I'm a designer of learning. In fact, you know, by trade, I'm called an instructional designer, as are the other members of my team. Mm-hmm. And now we're part of an evolving trade called a learning experience designer. But at the heart of what we do is good design. So we actually don't build stuff that we sell. We actually sell the service of building stuff, if you will. Right. So we it. have clients who have content. Uh, often our sweet spot is a client who already has an in classroom training and they recognize that they need to make the shift and then they ask us to help them make that shift and so we take that that content uh, sometimes it exists sometimes it doesn't sometimes it's great sometimes not so much but then we turn it into e-learning and we deploy it in many different ways because it is a a spectrum of digital choices that we have available to us now but to say to a speaker uh, build it and, and they will buy it. It's just not true. You have to market it like anything else. You can have a great keynote. And if nobody knows about your keynote, nobody's going to buy it. So e-learning is no different than that. All right. Well, what I think I will do is I will schedule a podcast for a later date and we're going to go through kind of the funnels and the marketing and aspects of that. And with you, we're going to drill down on what some of the elements of beautiful e-learning are. Um, Before we do that, though, Tell us a little bit about your own path. I mean, I've known you through um, the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers now for over 20 years. Tell us how you came to land on this marketplace today. Uh, There was an evolution for you, was there not? Yeah, I actually started into that world of adult education 
uh, about 32-ish years ago. I started designing training. I, I, I was asked to uh, write a training program for a large organization and, uh, and for, for a number of different reasons, they had asked me to do that. And at that time, I started to educate myself around adult learning. And then I found myself doing the train the trainer program so that, that program could be rolled out across Canada. And from there, uh, I just kind of stayed in that space of adult learning and increased my credentials and my experience along the way. And eventually, that's, you know, that's really all what I've always done for 30 okay. some years now. About 10 years ago, I started to make the transition to the online space through webinars, actually, live use of webinar technologies. And I could see that that's where we were going. I had done a little bit of CBT, as we called it back in the 90s, but it wasn't particularly popular. And it was really just, you know, done in very large companies with proprietary systems and all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I could see that this online space was really growing. And for whatever reason, I was able to marry my understanding of teaching methodologies and learning methodologies with, an, I guess, a thirst for innovation around technology. Mm-hmm. And my two worlds started to collide and come together in this beautiful way. So I started out with webinars, and uh, then I started creating digital assets for customers for part of their training programs. And then we would start to put them on websites, their websites. and. Pretty soon I was like, well, you know, how are we going to organize all this stuff? We need some sort of search tool or so people can find it. And then that led me to find out what a learning management system was and build one of those. And it kind of evolved in that way. So now it's, uh, you know, 10, 11-ish years later, it's 99.9% of our business is looking at what it is the customer is trying to achieve, what problem that Mm -hmm. we're trying to solve and how we can help do that through some e-learning uh, assets. I love how focused you are. You've gone really deep into something that you already knew something about, and that's fantastic. Um, oh, there's so I have so many questions for you now. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Uh, when can I say one thing, Jane? I will yes, say yes. That when I when I first got into e-learning, mm-hmm. I don't mean so much the webinar part, but I started to get into some of the more what I thought at the time was complex and, and it is, it's a, it's an area of study. Mm-hmm. But at first, because I had been a trainer for 20 years at that point, I thought, Oh no, I have to completely learn a whole new, uh, like a whole new trade. That's what right. I was thinking. And right. I went to my first big e-learning conference and I was thinking I was like a complete novice and I knew nothing. And as I walked the halls of this conference and went to the breakout sessions, I thought, Oh, they call it micro learning. I didn't know that's what I had been doing. You know, I had created ah. these mini two minute videos as part of a series for a client and, and they were putting a name on it. I thought, Oh, okay. I kind of was falling into it. And what I realized at that very first conference, because it was about four days, you know, so I had lots of epiphanies and aha moments, mm-hmm. but I realized that everything that I knew about teaching methodology, I still knew, and I would still be able to apply. I would just have to learn how to apply it in this asynchronous environment where the learner was not there. And I couldn't ever not wing it. But you know, when you're doing live delivery, you can piggyback on things that are said, you can top up, you can run with the teachable moment. So all of that has to be anticipated in an online environment. That's really interesting. So I love this idea of starting at, uh, let's say that we have speakers out there who are just now thinking about putting together uh, some sort of e-learning. And and let's just establish that there's lots of different ways to language this. Would you say online courses and e-learning are the same thing? I would say e-learning, the way I think of it anyways, is okay. e-learning is a huge spectrum of choices that you have. Online okay. courses are one component. Oh, let's can we map that out for a second? So sure. I'm going to put e-learning at the top of the umbrella here. And let's talk about uh, an online course is one element of it. What other, give me more. Uh, well, micro learning is very, very popular. That's bite-sized uh, pieces of, of learning that you deploy. You can do it in a series or you can do them as standalones. All right. it could, it, they could be videos. They mm-hmm. could be um, 
oh gosh, what's the word I've forgotten, but they, they could be ones that you've filmed live, you know, yes. you, you and me filming each other kind of thing. They yeah. could be animated videos. They could be explainer videos, which you see those awesome explainers, yes. white, white board and things like that. Yep. Uh, and micro learning can also be mi little mi teeny tiny courses. So that's where the two of them kind of come together. So you could have three minute course, five minute course. Okay. I, I saw a really great uh, micro course. So again, the language all starts to get mixed up uh -huh. on how to bake a turkey or how to roast mm -hmm. a turkey. And okay. the whole course was four minutes long. But and is that something you would, would that you pay for? Like I, what I'm thinking about right now, because we're getting ready to redo a lot of things over here in terms of our courses. So I'm going to show this to you, but nobody, I'll just describe it. I have this giant post-it note and I'm thinking about what my mini courses could be. And so I'll offer up a free mini course, which will then lead to my bigger offering. And so I've put on my list, all my mini courses, this could be one could be pick a lane, one could be develop the epic keynote, one could be position for big bucks, one could be from free to fee. And so I've, I'm kind of already on this track with you, Janet. So I'm loving that you're kind of talking about this. And now I see that I could do my mi mini course and micro learning might be two different things. I, I'm thinking. Am I right? Yeah. Well, micro learning. <laughs> yeah. There's such a hierarchy here. So micro learning really is. is just something that's short. Yes. Yes. But a course is something that is more built than say a video, a straight right. up video is you have to think about what you're going to say, but it's okay. still just a video. Right. Okay. Whereas a Stand course on video. tends yep. to have multiple elements that it might have okay. quizzing. It might have multiple choice and drag and drops and, it has more elements of design in it, and it may include a video or many videos, depending on how long the course is. Oh, boy. I can just see us really getting into lots of interesting things here. <laughs> okay, so e-learning goes at the top. Yeah. We could potentially have online courses as a chunk of that. We could have micro-learning, which is more bite-sized courses. Um, or, or individual elements. Or like the in, learning can be just a video, let's say. Right. One video, one explainer video or right. something yeah. like that. So okay. the, thing with, the thing with micro is it's one topic, one learning objective. It's very, uh, very focused. Okay. One topic, one learning objective. That helps to clarify. Right. So that list that you have, that lends itself well to micro learning on it, it, whether they're videos or they're actual courses with many, multiple elements in them. They're still one thing. One ah, topic. okay. Okay. Cause I kind of added that as a separate thing than mini course, <laughs> <laughs> which is semantics, right? Yeah. And, and then, but then video, um, I, I think a lot of people have really recognized that video as speakers is, has got to be something that we're doing and doing a lot of. And so uh, I know a lot of people are building out, for instance, their YouTube channels. Is that still under e-learning? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Like we can kind of straddle it between e-learning and social media, but still, I didn't even know until last week that you could go live on YouTube. Did you know that? You probably yeah, know that. It's, well, it's fairly, fairly new. I don't know how uh, new, but yeah. I didn't, it I didn't wasn't know. It was always that way, I don't think. I didn't know that you could do that. And I didn't know that you could do it from Zoom, which is super cool. So that's a new little uh, learning for me that when you use your, I think there's like a more button on your Zoom and you can broadcast then live to Facebook and uh, YouTube and all these things. And I'm just, like I said, I'm just learning, learning, learning. There's so much under this whole e-learning umbrella. Okay. Did you, know, did you know you can touch up your complexion in Zoom? As well? Yes. That's my favorite <laughs> thing about Zoom. That's why I never wanted to go live on Facebook was because it didn't have that option. And every time I'd switch cameras, I thought, ew, no, I can't. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. And so somebody said it was inauthentic. And I said, sorry, I don't care. <laughs> Touch up my complexion any day of the week. Okay. So you are really like a master of the learning element. So could we talk about I'm at the beginning of my process and I'm going to decide now what kind of learning I want maybe to offer. 
Um, what else about, is there anything else about that we should talk about before we dive into how you actually should structure this learning? Well, I would just say if we go back to that hierarchy of, of things, we, we didn't mention augmented reality and virtual reality, which are two other sort of in the same order of there's online courses, there's augmented reality, there's virtual reality. And I think that uh, augmented reality is exploding, if not about to explode. Tell, tell me it's more It's a about huge that. opportunity. What is that? I don't even know. Oh, that's a tough one to augmented do in a nutshell. Reality. Augmented reality. So okay. you will see, do you remember uh, QR codes many years ago? Yes. Okay. So you would, could scan a QR code with your phone and then it would take you to a website. I remember the first time I saw that used was uh, I was at the Toronto Island and they had put QR codes on all the trees so that you could do this sort of self-guided tour of the trees. They were all, you know, special species or whatever they were. Okay. So um, augmented reality is, is kind of like that in that you do it with your mobile phone, but I'm using, you, you have a, a placeholder of some sort. I personally am using Zapar codes, which that's why I say they're a little bit like QR codes. They look different, but they, they have some, some of that kind of functionality. But you can use uh, any image you want, essentially, depending on which tool you're using. So let's say you um, go to that same tree on the Toronto Island. Mm -hmm. You scan a Zapar code instead of a QR code. Well, now, instead of it taking you to a website, which is still a fairly passive style of learning, because now I have to scroll through the web website and read about this tree, instead, right. a digital asset of whatever nature you want pops up on your phone as a second layer. So when, if you're looking through your phone, you still see that tree, you still see the ground and the grass and whatever else is in your view, but now you see this additional video, let's say, layered on top. And it's a, I don't know, what's a tree person? An arborist. It's an arborist telling you all about the special aspects of this tree. So that's why they call it augmented reality. That's sort of the, my version of a simple explanation. You see something on top of the actual reality. So it's even better than reality. Wow. Okay. That is so interesting. Okay. And we're going to put the, the um, things that you're mentioning. You called it a Zapar code. Zappar, Z-A-P-P-A-R. That's the one I okay. use. I just think it's awesome. And okay. the really interesting thing is that if I want to change, I could put whatever I want. I could put a PDF in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I could put a mini course in there. I can do all kinds of things. But let's say I want to change for whatever reason. I want to change the video that people see when they zap that tree. Mm -hmm. I just change it at the source. I don't have to go back to the tree and change the code that's on the tree. I love it. Okay. So in terms of mobile learning, if, if you have people who are working on loading docks or people who are working in uh, tr transport trucks or people who are working in places where there are no classrooms and there are no banks of computers readily available, now you can deploy information or in this case, education to them exactly where they are. And you can swap out those elements every single day. So if, if there are speakers who are looking to, how can I expand my reach? You know, they can literally clone themselves by working with their clients to deploy learning through a route like that. Okay, so let me ask you this. Have you ever seen anybody do that in a book? So let's say you put some codes throughout a printed book because books, if unless they're reading it as an ebook, ebook, you it's very easy to make it interactive. But if they're actually reading a physical book, could you use it that way? I think that would be super cool. I haven't done it yet. Okay. All right. So now you I'm getting some ideas here. And we'll put uh zapper codes and things like that into the show notes. So anything we talk about here, uh, we'll have Monica put in the show notes for us. So Ooh, my mind is exploding. <laughs> you, know, you know what that made me think of, Jane, is that, you know, when you have little kids' books and they're those pop-up books, like you open mm -hmm. it up and the castle pops up, this is like that on steroids because yes. now the vi they scan it and the video pops up or whatever yeah. other element. And it can be a fillable PDF, like if it's more of an instruction type book, a, a mm -hmm. business book, you know, 
download this to your phone and fill well, in this PDF. Send you've it in. Never, you've never really been able to jump out of a book and into a video before, like a physical book and into yeah. a video without somebody having to type in something, right? Yeah, and so you can I, now. Really, I really like this idea. That's very cool. Okay. So that's what augmented reality is. Um, virtual reality, are you using any of that in your e-learning kind of? Yeah, yes. just some pilot programs at this point. It's okay. a whole area of specialty. So just from a resourcing standpoint, we haven't gone too deep on that. There's yeah. other people in the industry who do it really, really well. And I just assume partner with them when we have a component like that. Uh, but this is, you know, we're, we're taking this from the gaming industry and we're now being able to apply what they've been perfecting in the gaming industry for so many years. Okay. I say that uh, virtual reality, it tends to be very, very expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some low, the, the entry level is now affordable. I have some VR goggles and sets so that clients can play with them and get yeah. comfortable with it. But as soon as you get into uh, customization, the, the time to create is really long. Right. And so the, the labor costs are really high. You have to have deeper pockets. But having said that, it used to be that only, you know, aviation and medical industries really had deep enough pockets to do that sort of thing. Right. And now it's readily available to everybody. There's lots of untethered sets. The, the equipment is changing so quickly in yeah. that space. It's really hard to keep up with it. Uh, but if you have an, a situation where safety is an issue, I think then, then you should be looking at VR uh, for your client. Very cool. Uh, I just bought a set of Oculus glasses yep. for my husband for uh, Christmas, and it, they were only a hundred and some odd dollars. They were not that. Yeah, they're not expensive, expensive so anymore. The whole get into the game thing, and what I think this would do for speakers, if you put on your Oculus glasses and go traveling around the world or play a game or something like that, it would just it would just bring some creativity to your ideas and allow you to see what's possible. It, and it I think that's really our goal here is just to explore what's possible. Uh, you mentioned gaming and, and uh, you also mentioned quizzes earlier. How important do you think games or quizzes are? Gamification, I think, is kind of one chunk, and then quizzes and things like that, and testing you as you go is something different. So let's talk about it in terms of gaming first. How, it, how can speakers use gaming uh, more in their business, maybe as a marketing strategy, maybe as, what are some ideas on that? There are a lot of gaming platforms that are now available as off-the-shelf products, and you can just dump your content into them. So I would go with those kinds of things. Okay. Like, what, do you have a name top of mind that we could just put in the show notes to see something like that? I'm putting well, on the spot Ron, here. I'm trying to think which one. Rhonda was using Cahoots, uh, but I guess she was using that more in a live setting. That was Rhonda's scarf when we were at the convention recently. Okay, I'll uh, check it. I, I use Presto, Presto as a software. Yeah, and Presto is a platform. They have a whole bunch of, of different ones, and those can all be deployed on a mobile phone. Things like that are subscription-based. You could okay. never build for the amount that, of money that it would cost you to subscribe to them. But I like the idea of take a platform and then plug your own information into it and then use that. And this is kind of building more on the, you know, text to idea. So let's say you want to give away a PDF at the end of your talk. People would text a number and then mm -hmm. put in their email addresses and they'll get it. But this is going to be more than that. This is going to be something else. I think the big really big opportunity for speakers right now is that we can reach into the post course space in ways we never ever could before. Mm, so tra that. traditionally we went and gave a presentation, spoke at a conference, delivered a training, whatever it was, you know, whether it was an hour or a day or a week. Mm -hmm. And then we depended on bosses, leaders, managers, whomever, supervisors to in the workplace going. to keep mm -hmm. it going and to reinforce the learning. And we, we depended on the learner to not get distracted by all the other things that, that happen when they go back to the workplace and to actually use 
whatever it was that we taught them. Right. And so we know that that model fails. It's it's never worked well. We've always had it's it's worked well where we had a really uh, dedicated and creative and committed team leader who was saying, "Okay, folks, you know, we learned this last week in this course. We've got to use this and." You know, right. the reinforcing strategies were working. But nowadays with technology there and some of these gaming platforms that are, that are available, we can say to the client, okay, so we're going to do this training session and then we have this post-course boosting piece that we do. Mm. And we just bundle it in. Like, I mean, I guess you could sell it. I'm Again, I'm not the marketing queen. That's more your space. But you could, uh, you can bundle it and I always think that's an easier strategy. I love and, that. It's and included. then your you know your yeah and then your learner retention rates are going to be higher. And I think when you talk to people about and I'm talking about talking to buyers, if you say you can imagine if we just do this course and people go away, they're going to get distracted, they may or may not use it, or we'll have to depend on your supervisory staff to make sure it's reinforced. Or we can include this game as part of it. It'll be deployed to people's mobile phones they'll get this post-course boosting every three days for three weeks or whatever it is that you want to do. But that first month is so, so, so important. And there's tons of brain research around the forgetting curve that you can look at that, that will help you, you know, find the words maybe to explain that to a customer. It's called the the forgetting curve. The forgetting curve. So let's, let's uh, put a link to that. And I love the question to the client. Well, how long would you like this information to last? How long would you like, you know, what, what's the feeling you're going for and how long would you like it to last? And, and we have to take into account that we have a lot of clients out there who are delivering just a straight up keynote which is not necessarily your world, but I think a lot of this information can uh, flow over. And then we also have people who do keynotes and tra- longer trainings. And so um, asking how long would you like the, the message to last in any of those scenarios yeah. still works. Yeah, and- even if you're doing a keynote, I think you, you do want people to have result and changed behavior. You know, whether it's sure. a, a straight up motivational keynote, you want them to have changed behavior as a result of it. I love it. And so let's, let's offer the idea that you could include it and that would be a good time to include it is when you go and do a fee bump. So if you're going from 10,000 to 15,000, let's include something more as a, and and that helps you get there confidence wise as well. Or you could charge extra for it. That's always an option. And uh, the upsell may come later in your process. Oh my gosh. Janet, there's so much. There's so okay. Much. Well, I gotta, I gotta say one more thing. Then, okay. Because if we're talking about bund- it in. <laughs> if we're talking about bundling, then yes. there's the whole pre-course part. And again, this mm. maybe wouldn't apply for keynoting, but if so you're good. doing training, uh, there is more and more pressure to shorten up courses. You know, I can't be without people for three days. I, but I could give you them for a day. So. What can you put in a pre-course that is delivered online, part of the bundle, and then they come together with you physically for a day, and then there's post-course boosting afterwards. Now, the danger, of course, with pre-course stuff that I'm seeing, stuff is a very technical term, I hope you don't mind, (laughs) (laughs) but uh, with the pre-course pieces is that we, I think we're in a transition, we're trying to figure that out in the workplaces people don't necessarily set a time, aside the time to do e-learning. So I've seen some scary statistics, like people do eight minutes of learning a day now. Oh. That's what they have allotted. Okay. <laughs> Whereas before, if we had that three-day course scenario, we would say, okay, everybody's gone for three days, dedicated. Right. Right. But now, maybe they need a half a day to do their pre-course e-learning people aren't necessarily allotting that time. They're like, oh, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll fit it in here, I'll fit it in there. Right. And when you're, when you're looking at how much time does it, how much time do you save in this mm-hmm. case, it's generally a three to one ratio. So if you had a three hour course, it becomes a one hour online experience. And that means if you're taking a three day course, you're, you're going down to maybe like an eight hour experience. But I would say hybrids are probably something that speakers should be looking at where you can have a pre-course piece online, you can have the face-to-face piece, 
and then you have your post course bundling. Actually, I actually love that, and I actually even love it for keynoters. Mm. I think it's a really interesting idea of how do we warm people up to what we're about to talk about in a keynote setting beforehand. I think there's opportunity there as well. Wow, this is so good. I love it. And I love the idea of following on with like a game or something like that. Uh, so we're going to put Cahoots and Presto in the, uh, in the show notes. Oh my gosh. Um, let's go back to quiz. Do you now, I actually, I feel like we're shifting into what is the makeup of a good e-learning experience? And a quiz would be able to tell you how you're doing as a part of that. So can we kind of shift gears? Let's say we've kind of decided what it is that we're going to do. Give me some do's and don'ts of e-learning. And um, if you want to cover quiz up at the front, how would you use quizzes? Uh, well, some of those tools that we talked about earlier, those game-like activities that can be deployed, they generally have a scoring system built in. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get into the land of gamification. So mm -hmm. in gaming, we don't talk about marks, uh, but essentially we're talking about scores. And so in e-learning, we've adopted that gaming language. And we tend to, even in a, even in a compliance course, let's say, where the person has to get a minimum mark of... 85%. Okay. We tend to use language that says you need to achieve a minimum score of okay. 85%. And game, gamification has other elements to it uh, beyond quizzing. But just like in, you know, our old face to face world, if you wrote a good quiz, it wasn't the same kind of question over and over and over again. Too. It wasn't all multiple choice or it wasn't mm -hmm. all yes or no. It was a mixture of things. Okay. What's pretty neat about the digital space is you can do cool things that you couldn't do very easily before. You can do drag and drops, for example. If you can picture a screen, maybe it's a, uh, uh, you're having to sort foods into healthy foods and not oh, so healthy foods. That's and, fun. You know, whole, I didn't know, you know what you meant by drag and drop. That's yeah. so fun. Yeah, and maybe you you drag some of them into your grocery cart, and then you drag other ones into the garbage. Oh, so good. So yeah. good. That's really, really good. Okay, now that helps me understand it, the drag and drop concept. Um, and you can even have so putting, putting things in order. Like, let's say there's a, you know, the kind of training that you deliver, there's an actual order to how you install some gadget of some sort mm -hmm. so you've got all the all the steps involved and people have to be able to sort it into the right order and only by sorting it into the right order they get to advance to the next screen or yeah. they could get it right or wrong if you're if you're keeping score in that case that's really cool oh my gosh okay quick question that takes us back to our when you were talking about your own business do you provide the platform for everybody, is it on your platform? Yeah. So when we're talking about online courses with you know mm -hmm. multiple components, as opposed to using something like Zapar, which is a third-party tool that that we you know subscribe to their platform. Okay. Uh, uh, that would be one thing I would caution speaker speakers on. If you're creating a course, look at where you're going to put that course because you can actually just put it on your website on a mm -hmm. hidden page and use your shopping cart. You don't have to put it into a learning management system. Right. You, you have to have an LMS or learning management system when you need to record uh, completions, when you need the data. And See, so depending on who your customer is, they may want those reports, mm -hmm. right? And I, then I love the it. mark as complete. I'm doing a course right now, and it, there's this feeling of accomplishment mm -hmm. when you go through a video, and then it says, she says at the end of it, Mark, this says complete, and we're moving yeah. on to the next. I just love that Mark is complete, and I feel like that's an important thing. So let's make sure we answer the question. Is that something that your company provides, Janet? Yeah, so we, when we got into this space of creating courses, we looked around at the different platforms that were available and we didn't want our, but because we're designing courses for customers, we didn't want 
their courses to be at risk of disappearing ever. <laughs> um, so we worked with some of those early adopters and we created a learning management system that now all of our clients can participate on. It, okay. That's not our core business. Our core business is designing e-learning. Right. So we have that platform and everybody kind of shares in the expense of that. Kind of like if you had the cell phone, you know, the more you use the the little bit higher user fees that you pay. But we design courses in a product called Articulate Storyline. It's a software. So, you know, just like PowerPoint and Word and Excel are softwares, we design an Articulate Storyline. And then we do this thing called Scorming It, which just locks everything into place. I I liken it a bit to like when you make something into a PDF, it kind of like locks it all in Mm -hmm. place. Right. And then we put those wherever they need to go. Those scormed packages can go into our LMS they can go into somebody else's LMS. So, so large companies, sometimes they have their own, so they can go in there. Or they can just go on somebody's website, like Beverly Bowerman King. I, I think uh, we did some coursework with her, and she put okay. them on her website for a while, and now I think she has them inside Thinkific, which is another LMS. But okay. the great thing about building in that way is that you now have that asset, and no matter what, if you sever your relationship with one of those LMS uh, platforms, yeah. you still have your asset. You haven't lost your course. So that's okay. what I would say. I would caution speakers. If you're building in a third party builder tool, right, then you need to make sure you're keeping copies of everything that you do. Don't just go in there and build everything inside, right. you know, build the assets and then put them in there because otherwise you, you, you lose them. Right. Once you stop paying the subscription fee, right. for whatever it might be, then you're going to lose that. Okay. So the, one of the first steps <coughs> would be to, of course, decide what you're going to be um, running a course on, and then you'll probably need to look at what platform you're going to put it on, what learning management system, and what are some of the systems for people who are just starting out? Like, I, I'd look at maybe your internal one as being for someone like me, who's a little bit further along. I have a lot of assets, and I'm going to need to organize them. Am, am I right thinking that way? Well, I haven't used a lot of the third-party platforms very okay. much, right? I All did right. it sort of as, as a test in the early days to get acquainted with what, they, what was possible. Okay. Uh, to me, my experience anyway has been a bit like if I go into GoDaddy and I buy a subscription and then it, it's a plug and play or, you know, there's lots of different website builders like out there. I can, we've I can used stuff wish, in. We've used yeah. wish list right from the get-go. And I know that uh, there's like WordPress courseware and things mm-hmm. like that. Like are, are, is that where most people would start? I suspect so. If you're going to do a a build on your own or build yourself kind of course, then that's probably an, the easy route. Okay. Just to have something that's kind of low cost. And then uh, we're probably going to go into graduated stage. You know, if you're just yeah. getting, you're just starting to explore the idea, we don't want to invest a pile of money on that, right? Yeah. I think one of the difficulties around e-learning for customers and for speakers getting into it is there's a bit of sticker shock. Mm -hmm. Because remember, you're creating an asset that then is going to, you're going to get the, uh, generate the revenue over time. Right. Uh, For for customers, they may say, well, I don't want to spend that money on this course. But then they're willing to spend that same amount of money over a six or 12 month period and having the person come in again and again and again. So there is a little bit more of an upfront cost. Yeah. If you are working with customers where you can, you know, sell it as a program, then you're going to get your revenue back fairly quickly. And then you've got that investment and you you don't have to reinvest again and again and again. Plus you can change stuff really easily. Right. I love what you're doing where, um, and this is an idea for everybody. If you think that you'd like to develop something, find a client who wants to develop that same thing and then have them pay to do all the hard costs and you make sure that you keep your intellectual property when it's all said and done so that somebody else is basically sponsoring you to develop what it is that you wanted to develop on your own anyway. Yeah, I, I've been really fortunate to be able to partner with some of our clients in the <laughs> early years, especially when the, the infrastructure costs were quite high. Uh, we were you know, they were putting in some cash for tech support that we needed and we were putting in a lot of sweat equity, but Mm -hmm. together we were building something that we now both can benefit from. 
That's nice. Okay. All right. So let's get into a little bit of nitty gritty in terms of e-learning. What would be some do's and don'ts when it comes to e-learning? Let's start with do it all the exact same way. We need to change it up just as we do in an actual day-long workshop. I don't remember what the stat is, but every eight minutes or something like Mm -hmm. that, things need to change, right? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so my big don't would be don't give people the digital version of death by PowerPoint. (laughs) Okay, good one. We've all been in those classrooms, right, where the person turns and they talk at the screen and they've got a thousand words on every slide. Well, what I see a lot of is people taking those PowerPoint slides and adding a next button in the bottom right-hand corner Mm. and calling that e-learning. And it's not. It's just the digital version of death by PowerPoint. So I would say... Don't do things to them in the online environment that you wouldn't do to them in person. Oh, that's such a big, uh uh-huh. That's so good. Okay. That's number one. So even if you are, even if, you you know, you're going super low budget and you're going to do the whole thing yourself and you're Mm going to use PowerPoint to make your first e-learning course, I would say you need to have characters because you're not going to be there. So maybe you have, I don't know if you've seen the Bitmoji version of me, have you Jane? I don't think I have. That's funny (laughs) though. I love the idea. So so build yourself a Bitmoji. I I have one for myself. Okay. So build yourself a Bitmoji. Have your Bitmoji carry the course as the instructor if you want to. And make sure that you create other characters who the people can see themselves in the course uh, switch it up so that there are some screens that they're going to read, not with thousands of words on them, but, mm-hmm. you know, nicely designed PowerPoint screens. Sure. You've got the next button, but then maybe on that next screen, they click and there's an audio of your voice telling mm-hmm. them the next piece. And then on the next screen, there's some pictures that they, you know, have to consume and read information about. Unless you're using something like Articulate Storyline, it's pretty hard to do those drag and drop types of activities. Right, right. There's a certain amount of programming that you can do with quizzing, you know, the if-then stuff. You have to be a super user of PowerPoint to know how to do that. But, you okay. know, if that's what you want to do, go for it, learn it. Okay. Um, you can uh, have videos embedded in there. So just try to switch it up and right. have as much variety as your technical skills can possibly get. All you. right. That's really good. Now, some of the courses I'm taking right now are a PowerPoint with them talking us through it. But really, they don't change it up much beyond that. But I've been engaged because I'm learning. And mm-hmm. so I don't know. What do you, I guess maybe they're not doing the same like bullet points on each page. They're doing a picture. And then so I guess maybe they are following the rules of learning uh, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit from the sounds of it. I don't want to be judgmental and it's hard to know without seeing what they're sure. doing. But, sure. but could they say, okay stop it now and download yes. this document and yeah. fill it in and then come back and, you know, there's, that's what I say with, with, yeah. without going into a storyline type of product, it's hard sure. to have the screen interaction. Okay. Much. All right. Fair enough. I'm, I'm digging what you're throwing down here. Okay. Now we have a little bit of noise in the background here. Should, I'm going to go ahead and pause here for a sec. Good. Okay. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> You know, what? one of the things about recording podcasts, as you all know, if you have a podcast, is that life happens. Life gets in the way. And so we just roll with it because that's we're a lot of us are solopreneurs working at home and uh, the dog barks. Okay. Who cares? I know that you guys understand that this happens. And so that's why we don't try to polish up our, uh, our podcasts too, too much. Uh, J- Janet's got a construction zone all around her. So you didn't hear somebody dying back there. It was really more like a sander or something like that. So <laughs> we just decided to switch her location for this purposes. Okay. We're talking about um, the do and don'ts of e-learning. Is there anything else that's kind of big picture that people should really know about when it comes to e-learning? Like one of the things that I would say is that you really need to be using a lot of stories even in e-learning, wouldn't you say? You're right. I think that um, 
Well, when we design courses, we do a lot of work around, as I was saying earlier, creating the characters and trying to understand scenarios and putting, putting you, putting you, the learner, through those scenarios with the help of the characters. Right. Uh, so I, let's say that um, one of the things around gamification, which is really neat, and I'm trying to think how you program this in PowerPoint. It would be tricky, but you could probably figure it out. So you might have, you know, Bob, Jane, and Steve. And you have your scenario, and then you would click on each character to see what happens next, ah. right? You would have maybe maybe Bob is really doesn't have very good communication skills. And so there's right. full of conflict. Let, we call that branching in design world, mm. but you can see these, the three different ways that these three different characters react to the situation. Right. And then maybe you decide which is the best reaction and you would drag that one into the, you know, best or you might rate them best, worst, in right. between, something like that. So those That's again are, ideas around gamification and how you can make it interactive. Right, it, right. If you're using Articulate, you can actually drag things. But if you were just using PowerPoint and programming it, you could click on them. And then this is where you have to have your advanced PowerPoint skills because it would take you to a different set of screens that you would only see if you clicked on that character. Right, right. It gets complicated. <laughs> One of the ways that I have opened in, say, webinars and things like that before is this whole visualization of imagine you're having the perfect day in your life as an expert who speaks. And, you know, we've got the big paycheck coming to you and you're going and signing pre-purchased autograph books and the limos waiting for you by the curve after that crazy thunderous applause have come through in the uh, standing ovation. And so I'm trying to help them create a feeling that they may go, yeah, I want that. That's a cool day. And I've had a lot of people come back to me and say, I had the day. I had the day. You know, I was standing on, you know, in an, on an island and it all came true. So is there any of that that we could maybe apply into your world of e-learning? How do you think that might be used? Well, I, I think if you've got your uh, videos that you're using and embedding into a course, then you might have them, you know, have that inspirational moment and then stop. And if they have a workbook as well that they're working right. through, so you say, now okay, you write down. Yeah, before ah, you go to the next, be before you go to the next screen, yes, uh, complete this activity on page yeah. four. And we already have it. I mean, we have it in the books and workbooks and everything already yeah. to, for them to really draft out what their perfect day might look like. Oh, I love that. That's so good. Okay, that was completely selfish and personal, and I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I did a really great workshop many years ago now. It's called Webinars That Work, and it's mm. through Creative Training Techniques in uh, the U.S., which is part of the Bob Pike Group. Oh, yeah. And it's a two-day course it's all done online but it's live delivery okay. and when i registered for it i you know they wanted my address and i thought well that's kind of weird you know it's a webinar why do they need my address well didn't this massive box of course materials arrive wow. at, at my home a few days later right. and not only did it have a workbook in there and you know other hard copy books that i could read if i had an abundance of free time but yeah. it had it had some candies and it had a little squishy toy. It had all the things that you would think of having in a classroom, in a mm. physical classroom, because they knew you were going to be there alone. And so they were trying right. to recreate that classroom feeling since we were all going to be there together, just in different places. That's so, so I thought interesting. That was interesting. And yeah. Bob Pike, by the way, is like the godfather of train the trainer and training, is he not? Like he mm -hmm. maybe uh, experiential and that type of uh, thing. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I, one of the courses that I'm taking, they send a big, big box out. And I thought to myself, well, that's crazy. I would never do that because that's just so much. But the woman I'm taking the course from is earning $17 million a year. And I assume <laughs> that she knows what she's doing. So, okay, well, maybe, maybe I should consider it. But anyway, yeah. I, I, I would uh, try not to necessarily have somebody land at the door, but somebody's course might, that might be a perfect fit for. 
Yeah, and you know, you can say here's the course materials, print them ahead of time. Exactly. Lots of people just don't, they get busy, they forget, yeah. they don't do it for whatever reason. So, you know, I did find it useful. I remember sitting on that webinar for two days, which is a long time. So yeah. again, you know, based on how much, if it's an hour, I, I definitely wouldn't go that route, but it was mm. two days. And so I thought it's pretty interesting, actually. Okay, very good. Wow, you have given us so much interesting things to think about. Uh, thank you for that. Tell us what else, like anything big picture that we've missed that maybe we should include? Well, I think in terms of the trends these days, uh, you need to find your way into micro learning in some way, shape or form. Yes. You need to find your way into augmented reality, maybe depending on the environment that you're working in. But I think there's probably, it's just growing so rapidly. Okay. That you, you need to uh, to do that at some point. You need to decide for your e-learning if you need a learning management system or not, which would be determined of a, regarding whether or not you want to keep records. You want to be able to issue badges. You talked about getting that, that completion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and think about bundling things into certificate programs. Ooh. So all those things that you listed to me earlier that are on your flip chart there. Mm -hmm. that, that could, could be a a certificate Ooh, program. That's gold right there, yeah. everybody. Oh, Each one of those my goodness. is a course, right? Yeah. And so keep the courses short. I would say two years ago when we were designing oh. courses, we were they were an hour long. Right. But now I'm saying to clients, let's not do an hour. You know, we can still do an hour's worth of material, but we need to do four 15 minutes or three 20 minute courses because the, the threshold, the tolerance level has really come down. Yeah. And if you make them too long, people just won't do them. So if you think about going to your computer, Oh, you know, I've got to do Jane's e-course. It's so great. I, I really excited about it. Oh my gosh. It's an hour long. Huh? Yeah. I don't think I have time for that. Okay. I'll come back and do it another day, but they just never have that no. hour. And so if, if you bundle it in such a way that it's, six 10 minute courses okay well i'll do one you know or maybe that. i'll even have time to do two and then i'll come back another do, day and do another one and eventually they get the certificate done oh i really love this oh janet stewart well uh we planned on doing 30 to 40 minutes and i think we ended up closer to an hour because there was so much juice in here so i want to tell you thank you so much for taking the time out of your somewhat hectic schedule <laughs> the chaos going on all around you and being so focused you're brilliant and and then you just summed it up all beautifully you know micro learning augmented reality learning management system certificate boom 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 that is someone who knows how to put a bow on things everybody <laughs> that is uh something that not everybody does thank you for your time today you're welcome it was a pleasure thanks for having me and for those of you who have listened in, please uh, leave us a review and a rating on uh, iTunes so that we can get the word out about what kind of amazing guests we have here on the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. And with that, we will say, see you soon, Wealthy Speakers. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Wealthy Speaker Show. Please visit speakerlauncher.com for your free wealthy speaker audit and visit speakerlauncher.com forward slash podcast for show notes and many more resources to help you catapult your speaking business. See you soon, wealthy speakers.